специализацию, то следить за временем. С ними ты не поспоришь. Я приглашаю сейчас нашего коллегу Джозефа Вороса, доктора философии в области теоретической физики. Это институт, университет... Что, вот как все-таки по-русски прекрасно звучит? Суинбернский, это Суинбурой, да? Футуролог, член Ассоциации Мир Будущего, Международного общества универсальной истории с докладом «Макропроспекция. Размышления о будущем с использованием макро- и мега-истории». Um, to be here, I'd like to thank the hosts for inviting me and giving me a chance to speak to you about a few ideas. There's a real danger in being a futurist on the last afternoon of a three-day conference because almost everything I've written in my presentation someone has spoken about already. And in fact, I thought I was safe with Kardashev, but I wasn't. So hopefully there's still something left. So let me share, share some ideas with you. I'm a physicist initially, as was mentioned, I worked on general relativity and extensions to it. Then I became a technologist, I worked for a Silicon Valley company, you might have heard of it, Netscape. Now I do futures. And so my own little evolution um, has brought me to this place uh, to, to speak to you about the future. For me, the, the point of future studies is to ask questions. Answers, eh, not so important. The important point is to keep asking questions. Most failures of foresight are failures of imagination and insight. So therefore, we need to ask the sorts of questions that stimulate and generate new and deeper insights into whatever it is we're studying, in this case, the global future. So today I want to talk about some types of questions to, uh, that we can ask about the global future. Um, over a decade ago, I wanted to develop a framework to help me to understand how to think about the future, so I came up with a generic foresight process framework. Um, you take some input, some information, you process it through foresight, you generate some outputs, and then you feed it into processes of strategy and policy, development and planning, from the individual level to the planetary level and maybe even beyond. The idea was to make it totally scalable. There are a few sub-steps uh, sub in there, you might understand them, but the one that you won't have seen before is what I call prospection, which I define to be the activity of purposefully thinking about the future to create new ideas, or what we say in our field, images of the future. The different sub-phases of this are concerned with different things. When you're looking at inputs, you're trying to work out the quality of the sources. Are they any good? How diverse are they? How much can you trust them? When you're looking at analysis, the, the yellow box, you're asking questions about what categories of thought you're using. How are you sorting out the information? To me, the most important part, which is central, literally, and on the figure, is interpretation, the orange box, because within that you're asking questions about what frameworks of understanding am I using to make sense of the inputs and indeed defining the categories themselves. Of course, the real business of futures is prospection, generating images of the future or ideas about the future, and generating um, options that flow out of that, because it's only with a, a wide range of options that we can start to make some more careful decisions about whether this option is to be preferred or that option is to be preferred or whatever else. Phase of foresight are usually phase of imagination. So, it looks like a linear process, it's not. I usually leave all the arrows off because people get scared and they complain, um, but this thing cycles around, but there is an overall flow through this through a process, and these can cycle back and reinform each other. Some methods, there are many methods that can be used. The whole point of this is to not be reliant upon a single method, but to understand that there are, is a process to be followed, and particular methods are particularly good at some things, not very good at other things, um, and so there are different ways to combine different methods to hopefully produce a better um, result. I want to talk about the, the bold um, area, layered analysis, which I'll do in a couple of minutes. But first, I'd like to talk about ideas about the future or images. The future doesn't exist. It's not a factual space. You can't measure it, you can't launch a probe like in Star Trek. The only thing that exists about the future are our ideas about them. So, but our ideas are not totally divorced from the future that happens because we have an idea about the future. This causes us to make certain decisions or take certain actions in the present. 
these present actions play out as consequences in the future, and so there is a loosely coupled feedback loop. It's not exact, but there is some connection to that. So the ideas that we hold about the future are important, especially when they are shared, uh, because it's only by understanding these together that we can choose to act in certain ways to bring about the futures that we want and to avoid the futures that we don't want. So here's a model that I use with my students. Um, we're sitting in the present moment, looking out towards time, and here we are looking out into the future. And so these are judgments about ideas about the future. Everything beyond the present moment is a potential future. Uh, I cannot prove that the future is not predetermined, but I prefer to live in a universe where I believe that's the case, uh, because it means that I can influence the future. Everyone's aware of the projected future, a linear extrapolation of the past through the present and so out, often called business as usual. It's a default extrapolation. That's a fairly unsophisticated view. A broader view is the idea of probable futures. These all start with P, by the way. It makes it easy to remember. These are futures that we consider to be likely to happen. There is some probability. Uh, these are usually based on current trends because there's numbers that can be used to, to support that. More broadly still are the plausible futures. These are based on things that we think could happen in the sense that they don't contravene known laws of physics or known understandings of how things really operate. But they're based on current knowledge. There's a saying that we have in, in Foresight that in order to have your scenarios be believed, they have to be plausible. Well, the universe doesn't care about what we believe, so plausibility is not enough. The universe is exquisitely indifferent, in fact, to our beliefs about what should or shouldn't happen. So we need to think even more broadly than plausible futures, and so we have possible futures. These are futures that we think might happen, we don't know how, because they rely upon some future knowledge that we don't yet possess. My favourite example is the warp drive from Star Trek. We can imagine it, but we don't know how to do it. But I do know of some theoretical work, because I came from general relativity, that is trying to work out how do you design a warp drive solution. So maybe it will happen, but maybe it not. It's possible, yeah. There's also the preferable futures. These are based on value judgments. These are the ones that we think that we want to happen or that should happen. Conversely, there are those that we think should not happen and we should never allow to happen. So these are values. The others are somewhat cognitive. This is more from the heart. Over the years, however, I've come to believe that the most important class of futures that exist are the preposterous futures. The ones that we think will never happen, that's impossible, that's ridiculous, don't talk to me about that, don't waste my time. Why? Because this, and if, if you come up with an idea that, that does this to you, makes you respond in this way, this is a wonderful thing, because you have discovered the edge of your thinking. And so there's the possibility to expand your thinking into even more uh, esoteric areas. I love hearing about ridiculous ideas, because this helps me to make sure that my mind doesn't stay or, or get closed. So I love them, bring on the preposterous futures, and I'm happy to say, well actually I'm unhappy to say, I still haven't heard a preposterous future here today. Let's talk about interpretation. For me, it's the central aspect of this. Now, these are about frameworks. So what frameworks can there be? Uh, this is a complicated diagram, but the essence of this is that at the, the, the more shallow you go, the more detail there is, but the shorter the time frame, the deeper you go, the longer the time frame, but the fewer details there are. This is where big history lives. Worldview uh, and historical change, they are not separate like that. You'll see there's a dotted line between them. Um, Where's the cursor? There's no cursor. All right. they, uh, they overlap like that. Um, historical, uh, uh, historical forces create the structures in consciousness that we possess. But our structures of consciousness can also influence history. So it's, it's a, a more tightly coupled system. At the deepest level, you have historical and macro-historical change. Um, and depending upon your scope and time frame, if your scope is planet Earth and your time frame is the history of the universe, you're doing big history. If your time frame is the history of the universe and the scope is the universe, then you're doing cosmic evolution. So, how can you use this to think about the future? I want to talk about three classes, all of which have been talk, uh, spoken about by people at this conference already. Big history by a matter-energy complexity perspective. Eric, Fred, uh, David have all spoken about this. Uh, big history at, like that, but can I have fries with that? Can I have consciousness with that? Um, the building on the work of Eric Yanch, uh, as elaborated by the, the American philosopher Ken Wilber, and the third case, which David spoke about yesterday, so see his presentation, big history considered as a single case study, what sociologists call the ideographic perspective. How can we do this? 
David thinks of big history or teaches it in terms of eight thresholds of material energy complexity. As a futurist, of course, I'm straight away thinking what does threshold nine look like? So some types of futures analysis you can use on this perspective, uh, evolving the dynamics forward in time, what I call extrapolative evolution, very easy to do. Um, seeing how the, the uh, dynamics might break, disjunctive revolution, and seeing whether present dynamics might have some analogy in the past, what I call reiterative analogy. People have spoken about this at great length. Um, essentially, if we follow the evolutionary extrapolation, we know that we're running out of energy. All of our energy sources have less density than oil. So the question is, given that all of our social complexity is based upon access to cheap, abundant energy, if this starts to decline, uh, will this imply a reduction in social complexity and then to industrial civilization as we know it? Will threshold nine be a smooth transition to a less energy intensive civilization based on energy sources that are more diffuse than they currently are? There's a number of sources I've cited there. You might recognize some of the names. I call your attention to the third point, a book by Nafiz Musadek Ahmed, uh, a user's guide to the crisis of civilization and how to save it. I mention it because this is a textbook that I use uh, with my students, and when I go back to Melbourne um, next week, or later this week, and I start teaching next week, um, we'll be using this, and their job is to actually come up with solutions for the problems of the world. A little task. We, we don't want to stretch them too much. Um, the Ahmed book, I recommend it to you because it is an unflinching forensic analysis of the crisis of civilization as a huge, wicked problem. Uh, specifically, the effects that this has on agricultural production and the population it supports, because if energy declines, production declines, what happens to the population? In terms of disjunction, we can ask whether these uh, high density sources decline rapidly rather than slowly over time. We know that renewable sources of energy are not enough to power industrial civilization as we've known it. Many people have spoken about that already. The, uh, the key point here is the, the peak oil or the peak everything um, group, and in fact, uh, discussions of whether civilization will collapse entirely, Jared Diamond or Joseph Tainter. But it doesn't have to go that way. It could go up. There might be some miraculous new source. Fusion, as Fred said, is always 40 years into the future, so we can look forward to that. Um, nuclear energy could be based on thorium rather than uranium. It's got somewhat nicer properties and is somewhat less horrible than uranium, but there might not be the political or the social acceptance to do that. We might tap the vacuum energy of, of space-time, some miraculous source. Or we might get better actually concentrating the diffuse sources of, of renewable energy that we currently have. And we saw presentations on day one, I think. I've lost track of time. I'm still in my own time zone. Uh, I haven't quite made it to Moscow yet. Um, but if, we're, if it's possible to, to pull these together, then perhaps we can get the equivalent of the um, high density, largely free energy that we've been accustomed to in our gluttonous uh, civilization. In terms of reiteration, I'd like to draw an analogy between food and energy. For most of human history, we foraged for food. We wandered around finding it. We only started farming fairly, fairly recently. With energy, it's the same thing. All we're doing is finding energy that's been buried and, and has been lying around for 100 million years. But that power bill, that energy bill, is falling due. We've only just started farming uh, energy, and so what insights might come from an analogy with the transition from foraging to agriculture? It took a long time because not everyone thought it was a good idea. In fact, it was much harder sometimes to farm than it was to simply find things, and we find the same thing going on. Um, another thing I'd like to ask is, is there another energy source which is analogous in some way to the way that the discovery of fossil fuels led to an industrialization of agriculture? Well, Fred, of course, has mentioned geothermal energy. My interest is, is more in whether the, the geographical advantages conferred by the distribution of coal and gas, and we know that some nations were very lucky and some nations are very lucky because they've got these reserves, uh, whether in a post-carbon world or a declining carbon world, could access to geothermal energy confer similar advantages to some new group of nation states? Not an OPEC, an Organisation of Petroleum Exporting Companies, uh, countries, but an OGAC, an Organisation of Geothermally Accessing Countries, and whether that might be some new source of geopolitical power. Okay, the second one is all of that plus consciousness, please. Eric Yarnch wrote about information and consciousness as part of his work. Um, the self-organizing universe was probably the first uh, uh, 
It was based on the work of Elie Prigozhin, who of course has been mentioned uh, now, and other people have written about mind and spirituality as well as matter energy, and my interest as a futurist is, is it possible to combine these uh, apparently disparate views into a single unifying model? Well, indeed there is. We've been teaching it for at least 12 years in our course. Uh, it's based on some work by an American philosopher, Ken Wilber, building upon the work of Yarch. I'm going to show you a very scary diagram, so don't panic. This is very, very complicated, but it's also an immense simplification of the full model that he uses. Those of you who are familiar with the work of Yarch will recognise the development of individual entities in the upper right quadrant, from atoms to neocortices, uh, microevolution of individuals, uh, and macroevolution in the lower right quadrant from galaxies down to nation states. You can see in the bottom corner there that we have nation states, planetary civilization, and there is the well known sequence of techno economic modes of production. So, in other words, this is increasing complexity of material structural organisation. The numbers on the axes are arbitrary units of increasing complexity. Wilbur has spent 40 years studying consciousness, not just at, at the level of the ego, but higher degrees, what some, some people might call the farther reaches of human nature, spiritual as well. He found that there was analogously individual development in the upper left, cultural development in the lower, right, uh, lower left, uh, you'll recognise some worldviews there from the work of Jean Gebser, the cultural anthropologist, and this represents increasing complexity of interior consciousness, of interiority. Wilbur's claim is that these are correlated. You don't get the one without the other, and they all happen together at the same time. This is actually a model of big history. If you look at the right-hand side, you've got Yansh's well-known view. If you look at both together, then you've got that plus consciousness, please. So we kind of like this. What I like about it is that we can look at where we are now, the, the diagram along the bottom, and mention has been made about how there is the, the scientific or the rational worldview that is running things, well here it is, displayed. This maps to individual capacities. Those of you who are psychologists recognise that FORMOP is an, uh, a, um, an abbreviation for formal operational thinking, studied by Piaget and others. So these are all correlated and of a piece. My question as a futurist is, well what does this imply? We do some precursor analysis and say what new forms of consciousness are emerging. I won't go through those, but there are many writers who have spoken about this, uh, including uh, an Indian mystic of the 20th century, Sri Aurobindo. And the question that I would ask as a futurist is, as these capacities manifest in individuals, how do these map to collectives, and then how do these manifest as new forms of social organisation and techno-economic system? It's an interesting question. It'd be fun to study that. The last thing, Earth's big history as one case. Well, as I said, David's already done this. I had no idea he was going to do that. He had no idea I was going to do that. So what it tells me is that this is an idea whose time has come. In the beautiful poetic words of Carl Sagan, our civilization is one voice in the cosmic fugue. We are singing alone in the dark. And yet we are desperately searching for somebody else to sing harmony with, or at least to know somebody is there. The question is, is Earth common or rare? Well, David showed you the Drake equation. So are there other big histories we can use? Yes, we can look at analogies from astrobiology and from SETI. As I say, I thought I'd had it with Kardashev, but I hadn't, but because Kardashev talks about energy, uh, and it was explained in, by the previous speaker, type one civilizations use planetary scale, type two use stellar scale, type three use galactic scale energy. For us, Earth is considered to be a type zero civilization. In fact, type 0 0.7, 173 I think it's up to now. So the question is, what is the nature of transition from type 0 to type 1? Because that's the dangerous future, the technological adolescence that David spoke about yesterday. How is Earth's case similar to or different from any possible general case um, which might exist? There's much interesting work to be done here. <clears throat> and my, the thing that I'd like to, to wonder about is that if there is actually a, a galactic institute of comparative human evolution and there are case studies, what sort of case study will Earth be? Will it be a success story, a turnaround story, or a failure? It's up to us. Our future lies in our hands. We have the choice of life or death, the blessing or the curse. So in sum, these have been some ideas intended to open out our thinking about the future of our civilization, of our species, and our planet. Why? Failures of foresight are usually failures of imagination. So therefore, we need to be able to imagine a very wide variety of futures and the options that these present us to help us navigate our way forward through this period of technological adolescence. 
when we might survive or we might destroy ourselves. It's not a foregone conclusion. And therefore, using that to decide which futures we want to make happen as a species and which we most certainly do not. Because the question I'd like to leave you with, that if there is a galactic catalogue of technological civilizations, what will our entry in it be? Thank you.